And live now to the U.S. Senate, where members will continue work today on the farm bill. Last night, they came to an agreement on 73 amendments to that bill. Now live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. We'll lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal and dependable Creator, who harmonize the world with seasons and climates, sowing and reaping, color and fragrance. We praise you for sustaining us on this pilgrimage called life. Today, illumine the path of our lawmakers so that they will relinquish any motives that are contrary to your will. Lord, strengthen them to do their part to serve you and country with faithfulness and integrity. Let your peace radiate on wings of faith, hope, and love in their hearts this day and always. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which extends one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., June 19, 2012, to the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Noway, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I now move to proceed to count number 250S1940. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 250, S. 1940, a bill to amend the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, and so forth, and for other purposes. Mr. President, following my remarks and those of the Republican leader, there will be two hours equally dividing controlled, with majority controlling the first half, Republicans controlling the final half. The hour that is under the control of the majority has been given, and I ask consent now that. Senator Kerry be recognized for the hour that we have allotted to us. Without objection. And that will be a, that, that will be a full hour to Senator Kerry and full hour to the Republicans. Without objection. The Senate will recess from 12.30 until 2.15 to allow for our weekly caucus meetings. Last night we reached an agreement to complete action on the Farm Bill. As a result, there will be several roll call votes beginning at 2.15 p.m. today. Everyone should understand that uh, has amendments here. If you know the result of your um, amendment, it's pretty easy to figure out most of them because Senator Stabenow and Roberts will tell almost everyone how the re vote is going to wind up. You should be, be able to dispose of a lot of these by voice vote. I hope so. Otherwise, people can look to some very, very, very long nights the next uh, night or two. <clears throat> we'll also begin debate. Today, on the joint resolution of disapproval regarding EPA's mercury, air, and toxic standards, that will also occur during today's session. Republicans in Congress are fond of complaining that this country's immigration system is broken. We hear it, we've heard it for months and months going into years. But they're less interested in working with Democrats to fix this problem they say is broken. We've tried. They are totally opposed to our doing anything. We've tried, but we just get a handful of Republican votes. Mr. President, no one disagrees that I know of that our system uh, needs repair. It certainly does. But every time we offer, as Democrats, to work together on comprehensive immigration reform, Republicans find an excuse to fight sensible change. And every time Democrats propose bipartisan legislation to provide a pathway to citizenship for children brought here illegally through no fault of their own, Republicans have found an excuse to oppose our practical reform. 
There's no better illustration of Republicans' hypocrisy than their phony outrage this past weekend. On Friday, President Obama announced the administration would suspend deportation of young people, upstanding young people, brought here by their parents as children, provided these young people attend college or serve in the military. More than 800,000 young people who have done well in school and stayed out of trouble will benefit from this policy and become productive members of society. That's what we should all be very happy about. In this Congress, in the last Congress, Republicans expressed broad support for the principles of President Obama's directive. And Senator Marco Rubio, the junior senator from Florida, has even talked up a similar idea to the press for months, although he never actually proposed a proposal. This was just talk. There wasn't a single word ever in writing. Yet, Republicans' glowing expression of support for the president's decision were not forthcoming. Instead, Republicans have cried about the way the directive was issued. They prefer a long-term solution. Well, of course, we all do. They don't like the timing. They should have been consulted on an issue this important. Should have been left to Congress. Being left to Congress, we've tried to do that for years. And we can't because they won't let us. They stop us procedurally. Their complaints are varied, but they have one thing in common. None of them actually take issue with the substance of President Obama's directive. And with the polling results today announced in national press clearly, overwhelmingly supported by independents, overwhelmingly supported by Democrats. And frankly, Mr. President, uh, Republicans aren't that much opposed to it either. But the only Republicans that are opposed to it as a, by a large margin are the Republicans in the Congress. Leading Republicans' voices on immigration have yet to actually disagree with the decision. They just don't like the way the president made the decision. This will get, they, I guess because he'll get credit for bringing out of the shadows 800,000 trustworthy young men and women who know no other home but the United States. The, America is their home. That's the only home they've known. I talked about a girl here yesterday from Nevada, Astrid. Mr. President. She came here to America as a little tiny girl. She doesn't know any place else. This is her home. She's an American. She pledges allegiance to her flag. So I remind my colleagues in both House of Congress, the next move is yours. This reprieve for dreamers shouldn't be a, seen as a free pass for Congress. We have lots of other issues we have to deal with dealing with immigration. Instead, we should see it as a chance for Democrats and Republicans to work together on a lasting answer to the serious shortfalls of our bro broken immigration system. And as we work, we'll have the benefit of knowing the specter of deportation no longer hangs over the heads of hundreds of thousands of young people. So now is hardly the time to walk away from the DREAM Act, which would have created a pathway to citizenship for young people brought to the country through no fault of their own. And it's certainly no time to abandon calls for comprehensive immigration reform that's tough, it's fair and it's practical. But that's exactly what Republicans are doing. They're taking their marbles and saying, well, okay, we'll just quit, go home. Quite frankly, Mr. President, they've never been here anyway to go home. They haven't helped us anyway. So since last Friday, leading Republican voices in immigration reform have all but ceded the debate until after the election. Republicans who once favored a permanent solution for America's broken immigration system are now abandoning efforts to find common ground. And the same Republicans who complained they weren't involved enough in the president's decision are now giving up any involvement in the broader immigration conversation. It really makes you wonder whether they were committed to passing a DREAM Act or tackling immigration reform at all. Because, Mr. President, Senate Republicans have twice had their chance to vote for the DREAM Act. Both times they've filibustered the measure to a legislative death. So perhaps it should come as no surprise that my Republican colleagues are more interested in complaining about a system that's broken than in working with Democrats to fix it. The Chair announced the business of the day. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the following two hours will be equally divided and controlled by the two leaders or their designees with the majority controlling the first hour and the Republicans controlling the second hour. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Mr. President? The Senator from Massachusetts. Mr. President, uh, I would yield five minutes to the Senator from uh, 
uh, uh, from Colorado. Mr. Senator President, from Colorado. Mr. President, then let me thank the Senator for Massachusetts for generously yielding to me. Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include my complete statement in the record. Mr. President, uh, I'm on the Senate floor today to continue urging uh, this body to extend the production tax credit for wind. I intend to return to the floor every morning until the PTC has been extended, and I'm going to talk about the economic and jobs effect on the non-extension uh, in each state, and I'm going to press uh, my colleagues uh, for an immediate extension. Today I want to focus on a wind giant in our country, Texas. Texas leads the nation in wind energy production, the Lone Star State has more turbines in all but five countries. And uh, you can see this on this chart that outlines all the installed wind projects uh, in Texas. From the state, uh, the south and the west, El Paso to Galveston, from the Panhandle to southern Texas, the wind industry has created thousands of jobs. and It's helped boost manufacturing and construction uh, with good paying jobs. The town of Sweetwater, 11,000 people, has become the new spindle top. You drive past it, and there's a forest of giant wind turbines. Among the cotton fields of this West Texas rural community, Sweetwater is home to one of the largest wind farms in Texas. Even oil-rich Houston has become something of a wind power capital in Texas, thanks to developers like EDP Renewables, Pattern Energy, Iberdrola, as well as BP and Shell. Mr. President, they say that everything is bigger in Texas, and that certainly applies when it comes to their vast energy resources. Texas has it all from oil and gas to renewable energy uh, like hydro and wind. And this is no accident. Thanks to smart state policies, including a renewable portfolio standard which passed in 1999 and was later amended in 2005, as well as strong federal support for the wind PTC, the Texas wind industry has grown dramatically. Texas has an all of the above energy strategy. The Senator from Massachusetts supports that kind of a strategy. I support that kind of a strategy. Texas embodies this, and they've shown great promise when it comes to renewable resources. So if you look at what's happening in Texas, 7,000 jobs, uh, more energy from wind than any other state in our country, and it powers over that wind power over 2.7 million Texas homes. And almost 7% of Texas's overall electric power comes from the wind. It was the first state to reach 10,000 megawatts. And that wind power has helped avoid greenhouse gas emissions equivalents of 3,725,000 passenger cars. As well, the supply chain, the manufacturing opportunities in Texas stand out. It's home to wind turbine manufacturers like DeWind and Alstom, five major tower manufacturers, blade manufacturer, molded fiberglass, and many component suppliers. So this is an example of why we have to act, why we've got to extend the PTC. Without certainty, when energy companies are not able to grow, and they frankly will shed jobs and halt projects. In the Senate, we have a bipartisan coalition. Senators Grassley, Boozman, Scott Brown, Hoven, Moran, and Thune have been engaged with many of us on this side to extend the wind PTC. So Mr. President, let me end by quoting Carl Rove, who's known as a proud Texan, former senior advisor to President George W. Bush. He explained the wind PTC as follows. It's a market mechanism. You don't get paid unless you produce the power. And we're not picking winners and losers. We're simply saying for the, some period of time, we will provide this incentive. End of quote. Let's extend the PTC now. The solution is simple. We've got to act. It'll help American jobs. It'll help the American economy. It'll help our energy security efforts. So, Mr. President, I thank the Senator from Massachusetts again, and I yield the floor. Without objection, the materials referenced by the Senator will be placed in the record. Mr. Senator President, from Massachusetts. Mr. President, I would ask that I be uh, notified when I've consumed about 45 minutes. Without objection. Mr. President, 20 years ago this month, a Republican President of the United States helped bring together all of the world's largest economies in Rio, in Brazil, to confront the issue of global climate change 20 years ago. The President was unequivocal about the mission. George Herbert Walker Bush said simply, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. We have been that for many years. We will remain so. We believe that environment and development can and should go hand in hand. 
A growing economy creates the resources necessary for environmental protection, and environmental protection makes growth sustainable over the long term. When he was asked about his own target for subsequent meetings of the global stakeholders, President Bush could not have been more clear. He said the United States will be there with specific plans, prepared to share, but more important, that others who have signed these documents ought to have specific plans also. So I think this is a leadership role, President Bush said. We are challenging them to come forward. We will be there. I think the third world and others are entitled to know that the commitments made are going to be commitments kept. That was the President of the United States speaking on behalf of our nation and indeed the aspirations of the world 20 years ago. How dramatic and sad it is that 20 years later, shockingly, we find ourselves in a strange and dangerous place on this issue, a place that this former president probably wouldn't even recognize. Thomas Paine actually described today's situation very well. As America fought for its independence, he said, it is an affront to treat falsehood with complacence. Yet when it comes to the challenge of climate change, the falsehood of today's naysayers is only matched by the complacency, indifference of our political system. It is well past time, Mr. President, that we actually heed Thomas Paine's admonition and reaffirm the commitment first made by President George Herbert Walker Bush. As a matter of conscience and common sense, we should fight today's insidious conspiracy of silence on climate change, a silence that empowers misinformation and mythology to grow where science and truth should prevail. It is a conspiracy that is not just stalled, but demonized any constructive effort to put America in a position to lead the world on this issue, as President Bush promised we would, and as Americans have a right to expect we will. Mr. President, the danger that we face could not be more real. In the United States, a calculated campaign of disinformation has steadily beaten back the consensus momentum for action on climate change and replaced it with timidity by proponents in the face of millions of dollars of phony, contrived talking points, illogical and wholly unscientific propositions, and a general scorn for the truth wrapped in false threats about job loss and tax increases. Yet today, the naysayers escape all accountability to the truth. The media hardly murmurs when a candidate for President of the United States in 2012 can walk away from previously held positions and blithely announce that the evidence is not yet there about the impact of greenhouse gases on climate. The truth is, Mr. President, that scientists have known since the 1800s that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases trap heat in our atmosphere. With the right amount of those gases, the Earth is a hospitable place for us to live. It is indeed the greenhouse effect that makes life possible on Earth. But if you add too much, which is what we're doing now, at a record pace, temperatures inevitably rise to record-breaking levels. It's not rocket science. Every major national science academy in the world has reported that global warming is real. It is nothing less than shocking when people in a position of authority can just stand up and say without documentation, without accepted scientific research, without peer-reviewed analysis, just stand up and say, oh, there isn't enough evidence. And they say it because it suits their political purposes to serve some interest that doesn't want to change the status quo. Facts that beg for an unprecedented public response are met with unsubstantiated, even totally contradicted denial. And those who deny have never, ever met their de minimis responsibility to provide some scientific answer to what, if not human behavior, is causing the increase in greenhouse gas particulates. And how, if not by curbing greenhouse gases, we will address this crisis. 
In fact, when one measures the effect of taking action versus not taking action, the naysayer's case is even more confounding. Just think about it. If the proponents of action were somehow incorrect, contrary to all that science declares, but nevertheless, if they were incorrect and we proceeded to reduce carbon and other gases released in the atmosphere, what is the worst that would happen? Well, under that scenario, the worst would be more jobs as we move to the new energy economy, the opening of a whole new $6 trillion energy market with a more sustainable policy, a healthier population because of cleaner air and reduced pollution, reduced expenditure on health care because of environmentally induced disease, an improved outlook for the oceans and the ecosystems that are affected by pollution falling into the earth and the sea, and surely greater security for the United States because of less dependence on foreign sources of energy and a stronger economy. That, Mr. President, is the worst that would occur if the proponents were wrong. But what if the naysayers are in fact wrong, as all the science says they are? What if, because of their ignorance, we fail to take the action that we should? What is the worst then? The worst then is sheer, utter disaster for the planet and for all who inhabit it. So who's worst would most thinking people rather endure? The level of dissembling, of outright falsifying of information, of greedy appeal to fear tactics that has stalled meaningful action now for 20 years is really hard to wrap one's mind around. It is so far removed from legitimate analysis that it confounds for its devilishly simple appeal to the lowest common denominator of disinformation. In the face of massive and growing body of scientific evidence that says catastrophic climate change is knocking at our door, the naysayers just happily tell us climate change doesn't exist. In the face of melting glaciers and ice caps in the Arctic, Greenland and the Antarctica, they say, quote, we need to warm up the truth. And in the face of animals disappearing at alarming rates, species being destroyed, they would have us adopt an ostrich policy and just bury our heads in the sand and pretend it can go away. Just last week, a group of state senators in North Carolina passed a bill that bans planning for rising sea levels when creating rules for housing developments and infrastructure in coastal communities. Jeffress Williams is the head author of the U.S. National Climate Assessment Report. Ask him what he thinks about this legislation, he'll tell you it's not based on sound science. That's an understatement. But somehow the state senators that voted for this bill know better. Al Gore spoke of the assault on reason. Well, Exhibit A is staring us in the face. Coalitions of politicians and special interests that peddle science fiction over science fact, a paid-for, multi-million dollar effort that twists and turns the evidence until it's gnarled beyond recognition, and tidal waves of cash that back a status quo of recklessness and inaction over responsibility and change. In short, we are living through a story of disgraceful denial, backpedaling, and delay that has brought us perilously close to a climate change catastrophe. Nothing underscores this Orwellian twist of logic more than the facts surrounding the now well-negatively branded cap-and-trade program. Cap-and-trade was a Republican-inspired idea during the debate over ozone and the Montreal Protocol in the 1980s. It was actually inspired by conservatives looking for the least command and control the least government regulated way to meet pollution standards. It was implemented and it worked and it is still working. But lo and behold, when the strategists for the political right decided to make it a target because Democrats were leading the charge to address climate change, suddenly this free market mechanism was transformed into cap and tax and job killing tax. And guess who? 
coal, coal, the leading carbon polluter, was leading the funding for those efforts. What's worse, we have all stood by and let it happen. We've treated falsehood with complacence and allowed a conspiracy of silence on climate change to infiltrate our politics. Believe me, we've had our chances to act in these last years. But every time we get close to achieving something big for our country, small-minded appeals to the politics of the moment block the way. The conspiracy of silence that now characterizes Washington's handling of the climate issue is in fact dangerous. Climate change is one of two or three of the most serious threats that our country now faces, if not, in some people's minds, the most serious. And the silence that has enveloped a once robust debate is staggering for its irresponsibility. The cost of inaction gets more and more expensive the longer we wait. And the longer we wait, the less likely we are to avoid the worst and to leave future generations with a sustainable planet. In many cases, what we're talking about here is vast sums of money funneled into gas-guzzling industries and coal-fired power plants. We're talking about pollution, pollution on a wide scale, the kind of dirty, thick, suffocating smog that poisons our rivers, advances chronic diseases like asthma, lung cancer, and creates billions in hospital costs and lost economic opportunity. It's the same pollution that Rachel Carson warned us about in Silent Spring when she said, why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons, a home in insipid surroundings, a circle of acquaintances who are not quite our enemies, the noise of motors with just enough relief to prevent insanity? Who would want to live in a world which is just not quite fatal? Well, today, we do live in a world where there's an absurdity in the air. And it's got complacence written all over it. Fish are dying and water polluted with pesticide. Roadless forests are being threatened by an indiscriminate drilling. Industrial chemicals are sweeping into all of us. Young children are born with a burden of chemicals unprecedented in their amount. The burning of fossil fuels has overloaded our ecosystems with nitrogen and ravaged our plant life. Just go out and look at the forests and look at the change in the topography of, the wor of our country. Bottom line, we have substituted fantasy for reason, sheer whimsy for proven epidemiology, and it's wreaking havoc on our environment. You don't have to take my word for it, Mr. President. I'm confident a lot of our colleagues won't. But you can see it across the planet with your own eyes. Ice caps are melting. Seas are rising. Deserts are expanding. Storms are more frequent, more violent, more destructive. Pollution, famine, natural disasters, killing millions of people every year. These are changes that many experts thought were still years down the line. But climate change is now radically altering our planet at a rate much faster than the scientists or even the pessimists expected. All you need to do is look out your window. We just had the warmest march on record for the contiguous United States. The naysayers will tell you that one hot year doesn't prove global warming, but just look at this, this chart, which charts the acceleration of warming in the United States after 1970. This isn't an anomaly. It's a giant step in the wrong direction. 2010 was the hottest year on record, and the last decade was the hottest decade since we've started recording the weather. And April, May, and June of this year are already continuing the trend. For the first time in memory, the Augusta National Azaleas bloomed and wilted before the first golfers teed off at this year's Masters. The Boston Marathon temperatures hit 89 degrees Fahrenheit in April, more than 30 degrees higher than the average. People talk about official jackets and gloves and coffee. Who are you kidding? They're talking about hats and sunscreen and Gatorade and medical tents that were filled with heat-exhausted runners starting at mile 10 of the 26-mile course from Hopkinton to Boston. I've been working, Mr. President, to connect the dots on this issue for a long time. In 1988, 24 years ago, 
On an already hot June day, Al Gore and I took part in the first hearings on climate change in the United States Senate with Jim Hansen, who testified then that the threat was real, that climate change was already happening in our country 24 years ago. Four years later, we joined a delegation of senators to attend the first Earth Summit in Rio, where we worked with 171 other nations to put in place a voluntary framework on climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. Back in 1992, we all came together for a simple reason. We accepted the science. President George H.W. Bush personally traveled to the climate change talks in Rio to help plant the seeds of this new beginning. We knew the road ahead would be long, but we also knew that this was a watershed moment, that it created the kind of grassroots momentum that made people sit up and start to listen and understand the damage that we were doing to the environment. And sit up and listen, they did. The principles that came out of Rio transformed into a mandatory requirements under the Kyoto Protocol. Each nation accepted, each of the developed nations, accepted its own target goal. The European Union reduction would be 8%, Japan's would be 6%, and so on. We were thinking big back then, and our goal was to reach a total decrease in global emissions of 5.2% below the 1990 levels and reach it by the year 2010. Well, 2010 has come and gone, and so too have the targets. We all know the story. Global political leadership was distracted or absent. International negotiations in Buenos Aires and The Hague turned tense. The less developed nations saw the targets and timetables for greenhouse gas reductions as a Western market conspiracy. And then there were the trumped up industry funded so-called studies that challenged the scientific assertions for climate change scenarios. Looking back, it is not hard to understand why the final agreement got sidetracked in the Senate. After all, the developing countries were excluded from the treaty's reduction targets, even though it had already become clear by then that China and India were significant enough as industrial powers that to exempt them entirely would be a mistake. Nations left out were deemed capable of undoing all the reductions that would have been achieved by the developed nations. So it's no wonder that people were reluctant. No wonder that American companies were understandably reluctant to put themselves at a competitive disadvantage. And many in Congress had not yet digested uh, the science of climate change, even though we knew climate scientists were already studying the phenomenon of greenhouse gases. So the question is not whether or not the Kyoto Treaty had flaws. The question is whether we got the fundamentals right. And I believe the evidence is overwhelming, beyond any reasonable doubt, that we did. As I remind my colleagues, the view from 2012 is a whole lot different from 1992. Countries like China, South Africa, Brazil, and South Korea have now made far-reaching choices to reshape their economies and to move forward in a new and very different global area. Take China. China is already outspending the United States three to one on public clean energy projects. And last year alone, China accounted for almost a fifth of the renewable energy investment with the United States and Germany trailing behind. Stephen Chu, the Secretary of Energy, said it best. For centuries, America has led the world in innovation. Today, that leadership is at risk. Our indifference to climate change is putting America's economy and leadership with respect to economics and the future of energy policy at risk. So the United States is now the laggard. We're missing out on achieving sustained economic growth by securing enduring competitive advantage through innovation. The facts speak for themselves. Today's energy economy is a six trillion dollar market with 4 billion users worldwide, growing to 9 billion users in the next 40 years. By comparison, the market that made people so wealthy in the 1990s in America and created 23 million new jobs and lifted everybody was a $1 trillion market with only a billion users. This is 6 trillion with 6 billion users today. The fact is that it's projected to grow to a $2.23 trillion market in the year 2020. 
America needs to get into this. We need to get our skin in the game or we're going to miss the market of the future, if not miss the future itself. And I'll tell you something. We would be delusional to believe that China, given the evidence or any of other of our competitors, are going to sit on the sidelines and let this market opportunity fall through the cracks. They're not doing it now and they won't do it in the future. Only the United States is sitting there with an indifference towards these alternative and renewable possibilities. I realize that some will argue we can't afford to address climate change in these tough economic times. But frankly, nothing could be further from the truth. And nothing could be more self-defeating. We will recover from this slowdown. And when we do, we need to emerge as the world's leader in the new energy economy. That will be a crucial part of restoring America as a nation and, 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 and in a way that, 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 that honors uh, hard work and innovation and measures prosperity in those terms. Anyone who worries whether this is the right moment to tackle climate change should understand we can't afford not to do this now at the risk of our economic future. It is now that the most critical trends and facts actually all point in the wrong direction. The CO2 emissions that cause climate change grew at a rate four times faster in the first decade of this new century than they did in the 1990s. Several years ago, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a series of projections for global emissions based on the likely projections of uh, energy and land use patterns. Today, our emissions have actually moved beyond this is a chart Mr. President shows how the emissions are going up from the 1960s all the way through to 2010. And today we've moved beyond the worst case scenarios that were predicted by all the modeling that was done by the IPCC. Meanwhile, our oceans and our forests, which act as the natural repositories of CO2, are losing their ability to absorb more carbon dioxide. This means that the effects of climate change are being felt even more powerfully than was expected, faster than was expected. The plain fact is there isn't a nation on the planet that has escaped the steady onslaught of climate change. When the desert is creeping into East Africa and ever more scarce resources push farmers and herders into deadly conflict, that is a matter of shared security for all of us. When the people of the Maldives are forced to abandon a place they've called home, for hundreds of years. It's a stain on our collective conscience and a moral challenge to each of us. When our own grandchildren risk growing up in a world that we can't recognize and don't want to, in the long shadow of a global failure to cooperate, then clearly, urgently, profoundly, we need to do better. Frankly, those who look for any excuse to continue challenging the science have a fundamental responsibility that they have never fulfilled. Prove us wrong. Prove us wrong. Show with some science how this theory, in fact, is not being borne out. Prove that the pollution we put into the atmosphere is not having the harmful effect that we know it is and that the science says it is. Tell us where the gases go and what they do if they don't do what the scientists are telling us they do. Pony up one single, cogent, legitimate, scholarly analysis. Prove that the ocean isn't actually rising. Prove that the ice caps aren't melting, that deserts aren't expanding. And prove, prove above all, that human beings don't have anything to do with it. I'll tell you here right now, they can't do it. They haven't done it, and they can't do it. There are over 6,000 peer-reviewed articles, all of which document and clearly, irrefutably, the ways in which mankind is contributing to this problem. Sure, we know the naysayers have their, you know, bought studies that don't stand up to scientific review. And a few scientists who trade in doubt and misdirection about things like sunspots and clouds. But there's not a single credible scientist who can argue and withstand the peer review that climate change isn't happening. In fact, even the naysayers are starting to come around in their judgment. Just this year, a well-known climate skeptic, Dr. Richard Muller, 
released a series of reports that were funded in part by the Koch brothers. Dr. Mueller thought his results were going to show something different than all the other climate studies. And, 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 and what he found was not what the Koch brothers sent him looking for. Dr. Mueller, in his own words, said, you should not be a skeptic, at least not any longer. Bottom line, his studies found exactly what all the other credible climate studies have been telling us for decades, that global warming is real. And if you just step out and look around for a moment, you can see the effects everywhere, in the floods and droughts and the pathogens and disease, the species and habitat loss, sea level rise, storm surge that threaten cities. No continent, not one of our continents, is escaping unscathed. Increasing ground instability in permafrost regions, increasing avalanches in mountain zones, warmer and drier conditions in the Sahelian region of Africa, leading to a shorter growing season, and coral bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef. All of these are attributed to this changing climate. Now, Mr. President, I just want to take a moment to bear down on this science, on the cold, hard, stubborn facts that ought to guide us in addressing this challenge. It's, it's detailed to some degree, but, but, but it's the very detail that detractors can never address or refute. And it's important to see the detail in its cumulative force. Unlike the naysayers, I'm going to give point by point to some of the falsehoods and lay out the summary of the critical evidence that ought to lead America and the world to action. Here's what the science is telling us. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have increased by nearly 40% in the industrial era, from 280 parts per million to over 393 parts per million <coughs> in the atmosphere. And before long, we're likely to see a global average of concentrations at 400 parts per million and more. Within the last few months, monitoring stations in the Arctic region for the first time reported average concentrations of CO2 at 400 parts per million. And because of the remote nature of those monitors, they generally reflect long-term trends as opposed to marginal fluctuations. As atmospheric scientist Peter Tanz with the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Association points out, quote, the northern sites in our monitoring nectar network tell us what is coming soon to the globe as a whole. We will likely see global average CO2 concentrations reach 400 ppm about 2016, four years from now. Scientists have warned. Why is this important? This is important because scientists have told us that anything above 450 parts per million, a warming of 2 degrees Celsius, could lead to severe, widespread, and irreversible harm to human life on this planet. When concentrations of other greenhouse gases like methane and black carbon are factored into the equation, the analysis suggests that stabilizing concentrations around 400 parts per million would give us about an 80% chance only of avoiding a 2 degree Fahrenheit increase above the present global temperatures. Considering what a 2 degree Fahrenheit increase would mean, scientists obviously are urging us not to take the risk. James Hansen, the director of the Nasser Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has done the math. His analysis shows what we need to be shooting for is a stabilization level of 350 parts per million in order to increase our chances of avoiding the 2 degree Fahrenheit increase. Now, we've already exceeded that. So we're going to have to find a way to actually go backwards in order to be able to prevent what scientists are telling could create huge damage. Even if we slam on the brakes now, science tells us we could be headed for a global temperature increase of 2 to 4 degrees by the century's end and greater warming after that. Let me share with colleagues what sort of some of the postcards from the edge, if you will, look like when you examine what is happening to our air, our health, our environment. Warming temperatures, first of all. The first 10 years of this century were the warmest decade on record. 2010 was tied with 2005 as the hottest year ever recorded. NOAA has reported that 2011 was the second warmest summer on record. 
just 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit below uh, the 1936 record, and the U.S. Climate Extreme Index, a measure of the area of the country experiencing extreme conditions, was nearly four times the average. Last year, many northeastern states experienced their wettest summers, especially those states caught in Hurricane Irene's destructive path. Meanwhile, persistent heat and below average precipitation across the southern United States created record-breaking droughts in Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And these were of greater intensity than the 1930s famous Dust Bowl. Texas endured the country's hottest summer ever recorded for any state at an average temperature of 86.8 degrees. What's shocking is that the evidence of the rate of this transformation is happening faster and to a greater degree than the scientists predicted. So you would think that reasonable people would say, wait a minute, they predicted this, but we're getting this way up here, and, and you'd sort of stop and take stock of what is happening. According to the new climate report from NOAA, the lower 48 states elbowed their way into the record books this spring with, I quote, the warmest March, third warmest April, second warmest May, the first time that all three months during the spring season ranked among the 10 warmest since records began in 1895. In fact, the average temperature this spring was so far off the charts that the lower 48 states beat out the old 1910 record by a full two degrees Fahrenheit. Inland, worsening conditions are going to create persistent drought in the southwest and significantly increase western wildlife burn area. And that is critical. We've already seen the damage done uh, to millions of acres of forest because of the pine bark beetles which actually live longer because it doesn't get cold and therefore they don't die in the normal cycle. It's also having an impact on our health. As average temperatures rise we can expect to see more extreme heat waves during our summers and as we know from history that impacts people with heart problems and asthma, the elderly, the very young and the homeless. In the United States Chicago is projected to have a 25% more frequent heat wave days uh, by the end of the century. Climate change may also heighten the risk of infectious diseases, particularly diseases found in warm areas and spread by mosquitoes and other insects, like malaria, dengue fever, and yellow fever. In some places, climate change is already altering the pattern of disease. In the Kenyan highlands, for example, it's now one of the major drivers of malaria epidemics. And not just the health costs are sounding the alarm. As many have seen with their own eyes, the Arctic is among one of the most startling places to witness the adverse effects of global climate change. Great sheets of ice have been breaking off of glaciers, sheets of ice the size of the state of Rhode Island. Marine mammals are now struggling to survive. And where there used to be only frozen landscapes, there is now open water. Every new report that's public suggests the situation is getting grimmer in the Arctic. Last year, the multi-country Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program released a new assessment of the impact of climate change in the Arctic. It found that the period from 2005 to 2010 was the warmest ever recorded. According to AMAP researchers, the changes in ice melt over the past 10 years are dramatic, and represent an obvious departure from the long-term patterns. Their conclusion is startling. They expect the Arctic Ocean to be nearly ice-free within this century, likely in the next 30 to 40 years. Now think about that for a second. Within our children's lifetimes, one of Earth's polar ice caps will be completely gone. Average annual temperatures in the Arctic have increased at approximately twice the rate of average global temperatures. Within a generation, maybe two, kids will grow up learning geography on maps and globes that show simply an empty blue expanse on top of the world, no longer the white one we have grown accustomed to. In terms of impact, all of us who have been following this issue understand that the melting of the Arctic is at least partly mitigated by the fact that the ice is already floating. 
So the displacement in the ocean as it melts is not that significant. But if there's an ice melt from the glaciers, as we are now seeing, not only in the Arctic, but we're seeing in Greenland and in Antarctica and across North America, South America, and Africa. This is a photograph of uh, uh, the glaciers that exist out in the western part of our country, or used to. That was 1909. This is 2004, almost gone. And here is another uh, vision of, uh, the same, of, a, of a glacier, of the National Glacier Park, where it has almost disappeared. And I think there was one other, but. Uh, but, but it's obvious for all to see the degree to which the glaciers are disappearing. Uh, many, many people uh, may not also realize that, that a lot of communities in the United States rely on annual glacial melt for municipal water supplies and for hydropower. So as this disappears, the energy sourcing and water sourcing for the United States disappears with it. Just ask Washington State, where glacial melt water provides 1.8 trillion liters of water every summer. Or talk to the folks in Alaska, where glacier melt plays a key role in the circulation of the Gulf of Alaska, which is important to maintaining the valuable fisheries, the, the halibut and salmon that reside in that body of water. All of these impacts are interconnected. Again, the skeptics say, hey, there are a couple of glaciers that are actually expanding. And yes, there are some glaciers that are responding to unusual and unique local conditions and increasing in snow and ice accumulation. But the overwhelming evidence when you look at the vast majority shows that most of America's glaciers are shrinking. Over the last four decades of the 20th century, North American glaciers have lost 108 cubic miles of ice. That's enough ice translated into water to inundate California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Colorado with one foot of water if it happened all at the same time. In 1850, there were approximately 150 glaciers in what is now Glacier National Park. Today, due to warmer temperatures, there are only 25 named glaciers remaining, and some models predict that the park's glaciers could disappear in just a few decades, and, 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 and the photographs depict that. To make matters worse, temperatures are likely to increase exponentially in the next coming years. And because the environment is a closed system, the more conditions change, the faster they change. Because each change has an impact on some other interconnected component of the environment. As the ice and permafrost melt, methane plumes from under the surface that have been trapped for hundreds of thousands of years are now emerging. During a survey last summer in the East Siberian Arctic Seas, a team of scientists encountered a high density of methane plumes, some more than one kilometer across, and they were emitting methane into the atmosphere at concentrations up to 100 times higher than normal. Mr. President, methane, th th there are people who have stood by these these methane plumes lit a match and they light on fire. And the fact is that methane is 20 times more damaging than CO2. So we may become the victims not just of the climate change itself but of, of a vicious kind of feedback and feedback cycles in the climate system. Cycles associated with less cloud cover Changes in aerosols, peatland, soils, Arctic ice cover, all of them can lead to accelerated climate change. One study estimated that thawing permafrost may turn the Arctic from a carbon sink, that is to say a place that gathers and stores carbon, it could turn it into a carbon source by the mid-2020s, releasing 100 billion tons of carbon by, by the end of the century. What does that mean? 100 billion tons of carbon is about equal to the amount of CO2 that would be released worldwide from 10 years of burning fossil fuels. So that's the future that we're looking at if we don't respond. There's another postcard from the edge, Mr. President. Uh, the North Carolina doesn't think they need to worry about the sea level rise, but take a look at the evidence. 
Our best studies predict a higher sea level rise than previously projected. With the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet alone, global sea levels could rise by as much as 3.26 meters in the coming years. And the Pacific and Atlantic coasts could be in for a 25 percent increase above the average level by the century's end. In all, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet has the potential to raise global sea level by actually seven meters. Now, when people say, well, global, it may not melt, there are senators who have traveled to Greenland, who have stood on the ice sheet and looked down into it, into a hole 100 feet deep, and seen a massive torrential river running underneath the ice out to the sea as the ice is melting. And some scientists are even worried about the effect of that river under the ice. Could it act as a slide that actually whole chunks of ice break off and slide down on this watery uh, base that the ice is sitting on? Uh, they, the NOAA, Benjamin Strauss, the co-author of a smart new study on topographic vulnerability, said the following, quote, sea level rise is like an invisible tsunami building force while we do almost nothing. We have a closing window of time to prevent the worst by preparing for higher seas. I think that's exactly right, and that's why city officials in Boston are currently actively planning for how to manage 100-year floods that are now arriving every 20 years. We don't have 100-year floods anymore. We have them every so every five years, 20 years. In the face of global sea level rise of three to six feet, uh, by the end of the century, it's going to be a massive amount of flooding. So we ought to pass legislation at the state level to, to uh, plan, not to ban the planning. It's easy politics to ban it, but it's not smart politics, and it certainly isn't courageous leadership. <clears throat> we also have raging floods and water scarcity, the dichotomy in various parts of the world. From Veracruz to Songala province in Thailand, floods are devastating crops and stealing away opportunities for millions. On my travels, I've seen children orphaned by raging floodwaters, families deprived of basic necessities like food, clean drinking water, and medicine. I've also seen the ways in which climate changes interact with conflict, food insecurity, and water insecurity. People are fighting and killing each other over water scarcity in various parts of the world. Darfur and in uh, South Sudan, there are tensions over arable land. These are the invisible tsunamis that Benjamin Sprouse spoke of, and they develop slowly and quietly and determinately, and they devastate communities just as surely as they, would, as they should uh, kindle our sense of urgency about the cost of inaction. In addition, Mr. President, I'm not going to go into the details now, but there is major decimation of animal life and plant life and species life as a consequence of these interconnectedness. And in addition, forests. Forests are under siege from drought and experiencing more fires uh, and uh, more die-off as a consequence of uh, uh, insect infestation because it doesn't get cold enough anymore to maintain the previous cycles of those insects dying off. <clears throat> so the fact is, that unmitigated climate change is creating enormous economic dislocations already. And it's only going to get worse if we don't act. <laughs> Professor Frank Ackerman, a prominent economist at Tufts University, found that inaction in the face of climate change could cost the American economy more than 3.6 percent of GDP or 3.8 trillion annually by the end of the century. And he's not alone. Harvard economist Joe Vesaldi uh, estimated that if temperatures push past the two degrees mark, uh, or up to two to four percent of world GDP would be lost. 45, thank you. Boom, 45 minutes. So developing countries are going to face similar costs. Uh, back in 2005, the World Bank estimated the total value of the world's natural assets to be 44 trillion. The countries manage their forests, agriculture lands, energy and minerals and other natural assets are going to be the economic leaders in the 21st century. And they will be able to reap the benefits of ecosystems that they maintain. Mr. President, the message from all of this could not be more clear. Over 40 years ago, 20 million Americans, fully one-tenth of our country's population at the time, 
came together on one single day to demand environmental accountability in our country. It was called Earth Day. And they didn't stop there. They elected a Congress that passed the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Toxic Substances Control Act, and that created the EPA. America didn't have an EPA until the 1970s when people said, we don't want to live next to wells that give us cancer. We don't want to live next to rivers that actually light on fire. And so we made a huge transformation. We need Congress now to do what the science tells us we have to do, to do what our economists tell us we have to do, to do what common sense tells us we have to do. I don't know how many have read David Orr's terrific book, Down to the Wire, Confronting Climate Collapse, but it's important for everyone to understand his argument. Nowhere is the challenge of our moment more clearly expressed. He says, the real fault line in American politics is not between liberals and conservatives. It is rather in how we orient ourselves to the generations who come who will bear the consequences, for better or for worse, of our actions. As Orr reminds us, we're at a tipping point, and it's going to take leadership to respond to it. Unfortunately, we have been witnessing just the opposite. In a talking point memo to his fellow Republicans last summer, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor of Virginia took aim at the environmental safeguards. Job killers, he called them, listing the top ten job-destroying regulations. The Labor Department, however, keeps close tabs on extended mass layoffs, and in 2010, the Department found that of the 1,256,606 mass layoffs, employers attributed just 2,971 to government regulation. That's only about two-tenths of one percent of all layoffs. In fact, decreasing carbon pollution actually presents a huge economic opportunity in terms of new jobs and innovation. For every dollar we spend, we get $30 in benefits. And the U.S. environmental technology industry in 2008 generated approximately $300 billion in revenues and supported almost 1.7 billion in jobs. If we don't use the market, the other option is inevitably direct regulation. And, and it's clear that besides pricing pollution, which we already know to be effective, uh, it is important to maintain the ability to be able to regulate in the event uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the situation mandates uh, further action. Uh, we also know, Mr. President, that we need deadlines to instill a sense of urgency. There's a, there's a deadline coming up this week in Rio, and, and uh, where they are now having Rio plus 20, the 20-year 20 anniversary of that meeting I referred to at the beginning. 20 years after Rio, 15 years after Kyoto, we're still further behind than ever. The science is screaming at us, and the planet is sending us an SOS. We obviously failed to be held accountable or to implement the commitments that we put in place 20 years ago. I spoke earlier of the need to take advantage of the green energy economy. Mr. President, our best economists say that to ward off catastrophic climate change, the green revolution has to happen three times faster than the industrial revolution did. I believe that's why America and the rest of the world are facing this moment of truth. Will we step up and put in place the policies that galvanize our green entrepreneurs, that drive development of new clean technologies, re-energize the economy, and tackle climate change all at the same time? We are the country that invented solar and wind technology. But the Germans, the Japanese, and the Chinese are the ones who are developing it. It's a tragedy. Accelerating the transition to a new energy paradigm is the most important single step the world can take in order to reduce the threat of climate change. I am convinced that countries that take advantage of the opportunities are going to be the leaders of the 21st century. I've already seen that success in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was recently ranked first in the nation in energy efficiency and clean energy leadership, edging out California for the first time ever. I think my state is an example of the speed with which you can turn things around. Our unemployment level just went down into the 6% level. 
And it's because we do have that diversity and we are moving in that direction. Now, obviously, the government alone can't solve this. Government can help create a structure. The private sector is the key. But we need to put in place the policies that send a message to the marketplace that we are serious about doing this. The bottom line is we need to face up to this challenge once and for all, not just as individuals or separate interests, but as a nation with a national purpose. I know that Pew poll recently showed a 46-point gap between Republicans and Democrats on the need to protect the environment. So I understand that if there's a 46-point gap and we've had all this discounting and disinformation, this is going to be hard still. But David Orr is right on mark. Our challenge is fundamentally political. It's not about budgets. It's not about regulations. It's about leaders in the country who are unwilling to deal with the truth about climate change and who have cowed the silent majority into submission with their contrived and concerted attacks without facts. We need today a transformative moment in our politics. David Orr spoke to that in the book that I already cited. He said, our situation calls for the transformation of governance and politics in ways that are somewhat comparable to that in U.S. history between the years of 1776 and 1800. In that time, Americans forged the case for independence, fought a revolutionary war, crafted a distinct political philosophy, established an enduring constitution, created a nation, and organized the first modern democratic government and invented political parties to make the machinery of governance and democracy work tolerably well. Colleagues, we have made transformative changes before. And there are other kinds of examples. We once burned wood for our fuel. Then we transitioned to relying on oil and coal and now other things. We can make the leap to a mix of renewable energy sources, hydro, wind, solar, and others, but we need to set our sights on that next transformation. As the old saying goes from the oil minister, the Arab oil minister in the 1970s, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, and the Oil Age is not going to end because we run out of oil. Truer words could not be spoken. In the end, the question is not whether we're going to pay for climate change. We're already paying for it. It's warmer temperatures, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, floods, droughts, wildfires, decimation of animal plant life, loss of crops, insurance on homes, increased storms. We're paying for it. The real question is whether we're going to walk a path that now addresses it in a responsible way and helps us break humanity's addiction to the easy way, to oil, and, 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 and turns away from the other alternatives that face us. The question is whether we're going to suffer the consequences later on with massive, unpredictable scale in the form of environmental devastation, war, human misery, famine, poverty, reduced economic growth for decades to come. Mr. President, I just close by saying that the fork in the road points in two directions. The task for us is to take the one less traveled by. At the height of the American Revolution, Thomas Paine wrote about the summertime soldiers and the sunshine patriots who abandoned the cause. The science has shown us and continues to show us that we cannot afford to be summertime soldiers. So in this time of challenge and opportunity, I hope and pray, colleagues, will take stock of this science, will take stock of the choices in front of us, will understand the economic opportunity staring us in the face. I hope we will confront the conspiracy of silence about climate change head on and, and, and allow complacence to yield to common sense and narrow interests to bend to the common good. Future generations are counting on us. I yield the floor.